this first page. You can use this first page to type in uh, your thoughts here. Let's see, I'm going to share with Jamila the document. If you can uh, show this page here, page one, I'll put it in the chat for you, Jamila. And folks, feel free to click on page one. We're going to talk about challenge, choice, and result. So in a story, there's usually these three elements. And there, there are other ways of breaking up stories. But in a story, there's a challenge. So I'd like for you to think about what is a challenge you've faced in your life related to one of your identities or backgrounds? And you can type it into this Google Doc if you've saved a copy or jot it down on a piece of paper. And uh, thank you, Jamila, for showing that. This is what the document looks like. You can type into the fields there in the table. We'll go back to our slides. So I want you to think about what was a challenge that you faced in your life related to one of your identities or backgrounds? And if you'd like, you could close your eyes for a second and think about it. Maybe something's come to you really quickly. Um, what was that challenge? And think about, you know, as we think about the different caucuses that y'all are part of, um, perhaps you could think about something, a challenge related to one of those identities that is represented in your caucuses. Um, I'm seeing a question for uh, in the Q&A for the document to be shared again. I can um, attempt to do that. Uh, the next thing I want you to think about is a choice. What choice, what decision did you make when you were facing that challenge? And then the last piece is the result. What happened? After you do that, here is the next slide with some prompts. I'd like you to think about a little bit more. Um, you might want to use this story when you're talking about a campaign that you're working on or um, you want people to get involved in something. So you're going to personalize it. Um, by telling a story. It could be a personal story about your life. This can really help you if you're having one-on-ones and getting to know people, building allies around your work or a cause or an issue that you care about. So now I'd like you to think about with that challenge, why did you feel it was a challenge? What was so challenging about it? And why was it your challenge in particular? Um, let's see, I can give an example. I'm thinking about a time it's Women's History Month, right? So as a woman, uh, a time when I was pregnant and um, was at a point in life where finances were really tight and I was trying to determine what do I do about this? What, what decision do I make based off of my family values, the children that I have? How do I move forward? I was very unhappy in my workplace that made it very challenging. And it was my challenge as a woman to figure out what to do. The the person, my partner was not thinking about those things necessarily because it wasn't impacting his body. It was impacting my body. Uh, now think about choice. Here's the, the reflection piece here. Why did you make the decision you made when you were faced with that challenge? Where did you gain courage or not? Where did you gain hope or not? How did you feel? Um, so for me, I had a, a circle of friends and my mom I was able to consult with and talk with and work through my feelings and my thoughts and my concerns and my worries. Um, so that helped me to then have some courage around what the decision was that I was going to make. And then lastly, I'd like for you to think about the result. How did the result feel and why? What was the lesson you learned? What do you want to teach and share when you're sharing this story? And how do you want to make the viewer feel, the, the audience, I should say, the person you're talking to in whatever your story is? So for me, this might be a story I'd like to share um, around my choice, which I won't reveal here, but um, I, I might want to share the lesson that I learned, what that struggle was, the choice I made and why, and then really how um, I felt with the result because feeling is everything when we're telling stories. That's what helps us to connect to other people and build that sense of empathy, getting people to feel. So by me being able to tap into my feelings of fear, concern, worry, maybe there was shame there, maybe there was empowerment and strength because of the amazing things that my body could do and being a woman, right? So think about that, that result. How would you want people to feel when you tell this story? So these are three pretty much pretty simple kind of concepts to think about in telling stories. Next slide, please. Uh, I did see the document put into the chat for people and I'm seeing a 
comment that people need access. I'm pretty sure you can view it. You just need to make a copy. So Adrena, if you can check, I see your comment there. Check if you can indeed go to file and make a copy. It should be accessible to everyone, I'm hoping. It says anyone with the link could view it. If you can't, then I'm sorry, we'll have to send this out as an attachment later. Okay, so, oh good, that works, great, awesome. Um, stories make people feel something. So if you look at this document, this image here, you're gonna see a lot of really powerful brands in our world, right? Look at one of those icons, pick one, and think about how it makes you feel, that brand, when you see that icon, when you go to that place, when you buy that item, when you drink that drink, when you get those fries or not, when you open up that laptop, when you type that post, when you wear those shoes. These brands, they're so successful because of their, one reason is their storytelling, their marketing, they have powerful storytelling plans and budgets to get you to feel. Stories make people feel something and then you act. Then you go and you buy that coffee, right? <laughs> and you upsize it and you add all the things to it. Or you buy those shoes or you get that milkshake or you get that camera. Stories make us feel. Next slide, please. All right. So the truth is facts alone don't change minds. This is the thing that's really blown my mind when it comes to communications. Uh, the nonprofit where I work at and in my um, engagement with Black Lives Matter grassroots, it is mind blowing that truth and facts do not change people's minds. You can tell them truth and facts and post about them all day, make videos about them all day. We're in a society that really doesn't care. Instead, they want to feel something. And so I found this to be a very powerful reality. And that's why storytelling is so important. Next slide, please. Just speaking the truth, it's not. It's not enough to convince people of new ideas. Um, I think that when you make a small shift in a mindset of a person, especially through storytelling or changing the narrative around a story, you can then trigger a cascade of changes so profound that they test the limits of what seems possible. You want to be able to tap into people's deep, deep values. And that's what we're going to take a look at here. Next slide. Let's dig into values-driven messaging. If you're in your document, there is uh, another page here to write down some notes and type into the document. So values-based driven messaging, uh, they build on our values. We're gonna start with our values first. And then from there, we're gonna move into figuring out what is the issue at hand and what are the solutions and the stories and messages that we wanna share in order to get people to understand the message, to feel a connection to it. So I really like this, this message here, that a great message, it doesn't say what's already popular. It makes popular what needs to be said. Look at that. It, it's not already something popular, but it makes something popular. Next slide, please. Building a values-driven message. So here is one of my favorite images. If you've got pen and paper, draw a pyramid, and then you're going to draw four levels inside. Um, or if you don't have paper and pen and you're not able to type into the document, feel free to make a screenshot if you're using your phone or a screen capture on your computer. This is a really good image to use anytime you're thinking about telling a story. So think about a message that you might want to share. And we're going to dig through first the base of this pyramid because values-based messaging, values-driven messaging starts there. It helps people to, again, feel to connect, okay? So next slide, I'm gonna break down uh, some of these details here. So as Americans, you know, we've got 99 problems and, and Americans don't want your problems. They're not compelling. So the problem is that with problems, people don't want any more problems, right? So instead what we wanna do, instead of leading off with problems in our storytelling and messaging, we wanna talk about narratives, narratives that link to your shared values first, and that have then proven effective, these have proven effective at shifting opinions around, let's say, a progressive policy solution. Leading with values also reminds us that we need to challenge our entrenched beliefs about what we can and can't say in service of whatever your agenda is. So think about, I want you to think about a message 
that you might want to share in support of one of the caucuses that you belong to. So this is the next activity. Think for a moment, what is a message you would like to get out? Because I'm going to walk you through how to start with the values piece to lead with those shared values and think about the future you want, then move into the problem, the solution, and then finally at the top of that pyramid, the pinnacle where we want people to go is that action step. I want you to think, we're going to think about what is that call to action that you want people to respond to, okay? So next slide, we're going to walk through an idea. Feel free to write this down or, or to hold it in your mind. So um, let's say you're in the caucus. I think I saw there was a caucus for women. Um, I saw different ethnic and racial group caucuses. I don't know how to say that plural, cockeye, I'm not sure. Caucuses, is, caucuses. Um, I see the teacher education caucus as well, LGBTQIA plus caucus, disability caucus, et cetera. Think about an issue that you wanna talk about. Um, let's say it's an issue around access and representation. So I want you to think about then what would be that value? What is that shared value at the base of what you envision? Why do you feel and how can you connect to people through feeling around why this value is important and therefore is going to help lead to the change that you want to see, okay? Um, so what we find is that folks who are more conservative around issues, they really get crushed when it comes to value-centered debates. And so um, being able to start with values is going to give you a little bit muscle. What I have here, um, and you may need to zoom in if it's on your screen or on your phone, and you know, when you're looking at the slides later, I have two columns. First, I have a list of ideas, phrases, concepts to embrace and what they should replace when it comes to talking about your values. So here's an example. Um, you could embrace this first one and say in your messaging for something like, most of us seek to treat others the way we want to be treated. Okay, that sounds like something people could relate to. Yeah, sure. Okay, right. The next one is, uh, America is a nation founded on an ideal that all are created equal. Um, a little bit further down in the middle, one says, most of us believe that family comes first. So here we are, we're talking about some values, some shared beliefs that we think could resonate with people in the way we're using the words. It's going to make them pause for a moment and say, okay, yeah, you're right. I do believe family comes first. And then you're able to take them to the next step because you started to hook them on a feeling and a value. Some of the language that you may want to replace, I see over here on the far right co column toward the bottom, uh, you don't want to say things like hate crimes are at historic levels. Instead, toward the left, you'll see the alternative. You could say something like, our country's strength is grounded in our ability to work together. So you're talking about a value instead of like, this horrible, terrible thing is happening and it's very impersonal. Um, here's another one to replace on the right toward the bottom. It's there's a war on workers. Instead, if you want to flip that around and talk about a value, you could say all work has value and all working people have rights. Okay, hope that's helpful and makes a little sense. So we're going to start with the values. Sometimes I'll brainstorm just a list of the values and things that we agree and, and believe in around this the, our work or our culture for whatever group we're working in uh, to be able to talk about the issue. All right, next slide, please. We're going to go into problems. So just checking my time here. Okay, so around problems, what we've got is it's important to really convey what's at stake in our fights. So you want to bring people into the frame. So think about if you're, you've got a picture frame or if you're looking through a camera, you want to pull the people into that focus point there. And what we're going to do is we're going to offer very clear villains and heroes. Any story has a, a hero, right? Pretty much who's going to go through a, a conflict, a challenge, like the story we thought about a little bit earlier today. So you're going to want to pay attention to how you describe the problem and be really clear about its origin. So now these, uh, this language here, it's going to be in this chart. It's a little bit smaller. So I know it's a bit hard to read in the presentation. Um, but here are some things that you could embrace. You could embrace saying things like CEOs decided to pay people less and lawmakers took our coverage. Okay. The president of X group decided to pay people less and 
the maybe it's the the board just took our coverage for example so you're very clearly talking about the villains and the heroes we're the we're the hero the villains are those people that you were talking about you really want to paint that picture you no longer want to say something like this this is in the top on the right column under what you would replace you don't want to say things like jobs and homes were lost that's pretty passive you don't want to say people will lose coverage Instead, we're painting the picture of who is the villain, who is the hero, right? Because systemic inequalities, they don't create themselves. The gap between folks, they don't widen on their own accord. You know, people, they might lose their keys, they might lose their wallets, but they're not losing their coverage. Instead, there are villains who are taking these things and who are forcing um, maybe wages down or holding on to funds and not providing wages to workers. So there is an example of how to really paint the picture around the motive because motives do matter. Okay, next slide. Change. Okay. So, oh, I don't know why it's showing up that way. Sorry. Oh, should not look like that. Something happened with the default. Um, I will read out what some of these words are because it's terrible to look at right now, so sorry. Um, what we're looking at here are some issues, challenges, and problems that we may face when we're thinking about who are the heroes and who are the villains. So what you wanna do is after you've talked about the value and you've talked about, then you go into talking about the problem, you'll start talking, you'll, you'll ease into that next. Usually we wanna talk about the problem first. Here we have a wide range of problems that we might be concerned about in our caucuses, in our groups, in our organizations. We've got health disparities, food access, incarceration, police violence, immigration, colorism, trauma, violence, pay inequity, xenophobia, pollution, hate crimes, sexism, homophobia, invisibility, homelessness, poverty, racism, the list goes on and on. And so what we need to do is remember to openly name the race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity issues that our opponents dismissively label as identity politics. Uh, there has been a lot of this um, information I'm sharing is based off of message testing, and it's proven most effective to talk about these issues, these challenges and problems after sharing that value. So by framing the harm that we describe as an attack, not only on some groups, but also on the shared value that was established at the offset, at the outset. So that's why we started with the value, right? Okay, we're gonna, let's move from this slide because it's hurting my eyes. That's not good, sorry. All right, so let's think about those issues, those problems and your gore issue that you wanna send some messaging out around and, and build a story around. We're then gonna move into a solution. So let's look at some ways to, to talk about solutions. You wanna create something good. You don't merely wanna reduce something bad. Some ways, some language to embrace would be like, hey, we want to create an immigration process, right? Um, you might say, we want to earn a good living and have a good life. Uh, the last one there, we value creating safe and healthy communities. We use that a lot in our work. We believe in protecting our children's health. We believe in, if you're in a university, protecting our students' mental health, okay? And you want to replace, you no longer want to use phrases like, let's fix our broken immigration system or better wages and benefits or let's stop or slow down things like climate change. Instead, you really wanna put the people first again. <laughs> I love this idea that Dr. King had a dream and not a complaint. Okay, I see a question around comprehensive immigration reform. We might be able to get to that in a bit. Next slide, please. All right, last but not least, we move to this to, oh, yep, we move up to the very top to the action. We wanna focus on outcomes and not on process. So action is at the tippity top there and thinking about what is your call to action? What do you want people to do? You don't wanna tell a story. You don't wanna have your messaging out there. You may not even wanna post on social media around 
a, a campaign or something you're trying to communicate without getting here because really you should always have a way to invite people to click on something or donate or show up or speak your voice or share this message or email someone or call a legislator. So it's really important to get people from the values feeling all the way up to action. And if you think about marketing, this is happening every day. You're feeling something when you see that Starbucks logo or that Nike or that McDonald's and you're moving all the way up to action pretty quickly. So we know that this can work. Thank you. Next slide. All right. So love Audre Lorde, a womanist, radical feminist from the 30s to the 90s. She was around and she said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So that's why we're going to use tools around messaging with values at the center and narrative change so that we can change and shift how people think about this work. I, I would love to ask y'all to think about what kinds of tools you all, if you're an, consider yourself an activist, an organizer, an educator, what kinds of tools do you have available to make positive change in community? Some of it as a communications person, I could say is, is on technology. We're in a world today where you can really make an impact with social media. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Here we go. We're going to dig now into this third section, and this is around narrative change. And uh, you'll find a chart in our material handout. Please share in the chat or in the Q&A if you weren't able to open the document so we make sure that you uh, are able to access it. All right, narrative change. So narrative change will, again, be able to impact some really small shifts in mindset. This is a marathon, storytelling, narrative change, using values-based messaging in the way that it can make an impact. It's a marathon. These seeds need to be planted over time, slowly and surely. We're able to shift people's mindsets that then there can be that moment that can trigger that cascade of change so profound that it can test the limits of what you might have thought was possible. And one of my favorite phrases, a message that didn't say what was already popular, but made popular what needed to be popular, right, is the message around, for example, Black Lives Matter, just that one hashtag. And the work and organizing and people on the ground, um, especially I believe it was in Ferguson and um, after the death of Dray Trayvon Martin as well, and leading up to the racial uprisings after the death of George Floyd, just that phrase and that messaging of that value of my life matters with my pigmentation and my melanation, that that matters that was able, that phrase, those three words was able to make incredible change that we can see today in, in the world around us and more continues to need to be made. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about narrative change. Um, human beings, you know, again, we're, we're storytellers. We have been through the centuries. It's natural, it comes for us. I always consider myself a terrible, audible storyteller. I hate telling stories with my friends or my family because I I just sometimes will forget details. I might even fabricate a little bit. I'll forget. I, I'm better at writing and write, writing is my jam. I can find some great, you know, multi-syllabic words to throw into a written speech or a written story or a blog post, but there's something that happens to me in telling the story. I say that to say that we all have our ways, our means to tell stories, and it is natural to us as humans. It's been that way forever. Stories and narratives, they do help us make sense of the world around us and communicate with others and build lasting relationships. Next slide. So when we look, think about a story and we think about a narrative, I want to make a connection here. So what a tile may be to a mosaic creating this mosaic, a story is to a narrative. So this relationship is really interesting. A story can bring a narrative to life by making them relatable and accessible. And then a narrative can infuse the story with deeper meaning. So we're gonna take a look at some of that deeper meaning. Next slide. Uh, I wanna just take a pause for a moment and sit on this idea. Uh, a saying from the Navajo that, we trust our memory more than your history. So I'm curious, I wish that we could uh, see some responses here, but what, how might that, what, what do you think about that? To me, it makes me think about 
who is the storyteller? Who's creating this story and this narrative over time to tell the story and to build understanding, connection, empathy, belief around a story? Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna talk about narratives. So narrative change, it's a collection of stories that when they're together, they're gonna give you a worldview meaning. Um, it's a shared interpretation of the world and how it works. So a story is something that happens to someone or something. A story can bring a narrative to life. It can make it uh, relatable, accessible, even personal. What happened here? Can you click again, please? I'm not seeing the image. Uh, a narrative, it's a pattern, uh, a system, a collection of stories. They can run deep over time. It's a story layered upon story, layered upon story. It can reinforce a central or dominant belief, ideas, and meaning in a culture. So I like looking at this picture and just thinking about, huh, what's the story here? Some old pictures, some you know, mysterious faces, and I'm starting to make some assumptions based on what I see of what's happening in that bottom right picture. Who is the woman in the background? Who is the child she's holding? And there's a story there. And then I think about the narrative of story upon story upon story, that mosaic, right? Tile upon tile upon tile. And I'm, I'm making, I have some ideas in my mind about that woman in the back. And my neighbor or the person, uh, that I'm at the stoplight next to in traffic, we may have very different understandings of who that woman might be in the background, her intelligence level, her beauty or attractiveness, her worth, maybe even how her voice sounded and the words she used. And then we might have very different ideas about who is this child on the lap and who did this child turn out to be and what was that relationship? So there's narratives and there's stories and these ideas are planted inside of our minds. Let's explore a story. I'm gonna tell you a story about a history about sharks. This is a really cool example about stories and narratives. So there were five swimmers who were attacked by sharks along the East Coast of the United States, um, oops, excuse me, in July of 1916. Four swimmers died, and as widespread fear and panic gripped the nation, then it was President Woodrow Wilson, he called an emergency cabinet meeting. So a national alarm was raised, and forces were sent to hunt these beasts. So again, if we know that a narrative is a collection of stories refined over time, and they infuse stories with deeper meaning, so the story was what happened to someone, the story, there were five swimmers attacked by sharks, okay? Four of the swimmers died. So let's think about this narrative now, story upon story. The narrative is that sharks are vicious. They're man-eating predators that frequently attack and kill human beings, and they pose an imminent and constant threat, okay? But then if let's dig a little bit deeper and let's uh, think about our values and our worldviews, because that's what's underneath the story our values. Remember going back to that values-based messaging, the values connect yet again here. So, um, excuse me, our worldviews are embedded and pervasive in culture. We use them to understand our history, our current events, while we inform our identity, our community, and our belonging. And then our values and worldviews shape our relationship to, in this case, sharks. So now we believe and think this idea that Humans and nature are in a continual battle and we're defenseless against nature. So we fear the unknown. That becomes our worldview because we based it on these values and this narrative around the story of a shark. When I look at this and I think about that idea, I, I can't help it, but I start to think about the narrative around black men and the narrative of the story upon story upon story that then frames thinking much like a shark. Uh, you know, it's actually been said uh, and studied that you're more likely to die by, here's a couple things you're more likely to die by than a shark attack. You're more likely to die by a coconut falling on your head, 
Um, I want to say you're more likely to die by, uh, I want to say a jellyfish. I can't, I'd have to confirm that one. But the other one that is incredible, you're more likely to die by a vending machine that falls on you and crushes you than a shark. You know, if you're shaking it, trying to get the food out that hasn't come down or out of the contraption at the bottom. So it, it goes to tell you those stories upon stories have impacted this narrative. And what did I say earlier? Telling the truth and facts, that's not necessarily the most powerful way to convince people, right? Next slide, please. All right, let's take a look at this narrative um, image. So what we've got here is let's, we're going to use the ocean. And at the very top, you can see those messages. We want to use values-based messages. The values are at the bottom. We've got the stories. Then middle level is that narrative. And deep underneath are our values and our worldview. So a story, it shares something that happens to someone or something. Uh, it brings a narrative to life by making it relatable, accessible, and personal. So that's what we want to do when we tell our personal stories or a story about how the work that we're doing, the cause we care about, has really impacted people very positively. Then from there, we go to narratives. Narratives are a collection of stories that are refined over time and then fuse stories with deeper meaning. So let's go even deeper there. So further below that surface, that's where we see our values, our worldview. These are embedded, they're pervasive in our culture. We use them to understand history and current events and they shape our relationship to subjects. Next slide. Now we get into thinking about framing. And I am so sorry that this visually looks that way. There's something happening with the technology there. Your PDF will not look like that. So if a narrative is framed in the right way, it can really get changes to be sparked in how people think. It can deepen people's understanding of issues and shift mindsets. It can also shift difficult conversations in a positive way. So how we talk about an issue, remember that list of issues that were highlighted in yellow, how we talk about it can change how other people think and act. How we talk about, for example, Black people and Black lives by talking about the value about life mattering, that was able to impact how people think and act. So the world we live in really can be remade through, I love this idea of our collective imagination, and that's what you see framed in this picture here. Narrative, narrative change, it's a practice and it exposes, it explores how to expose, shift and transform those deep patterns on which we build our worldviews and the stories that perpetuate them. Okay, next slide, please. So this is in your document as well. These are the four cornerstones when it comes to thinking about your narrative and doing a power analysis. For those of you who are engaged in organizing, you'll you'll feel familiar with the concept of a power analysis. Um, what we want to do is look at these four cornerstones, and this is information adapted from the Center for Story-Based Strategy. We want to look at these cornerstones to define the aspects of a campaign or, or some work you want to do and set some parameters around that narrative you want to develop. And so what you'll do is you'll think about each of these items to um, clarify them and provide the foundation that you're going to build your narrative on. So first we start with the goal at the top left. Think about what do you want to achieve with this project, effort, campaign that you're working on, maybe in your caucus, right? What's that specific change you want to make? Then the top right, you can, you can do this with a piece of paper. Just think about these four items folded into fours and, and just jot down some thoughts there. What's your audience? Audience is everything and thinking about how you want to send your message out or tell your story. So who are those specific groups of people that you need to reach and persuade, right? Then on the bottom left, you've got the target. Who are those decision makers that can make this desired change happen? And then lastly, think about your constituency. Who is your base? Who are the organized groups of people or communities that you already work with, who represent you or you share common interests with? So this is going to help us by laying out these four cornerstones. We're going to be able to do an activity or you can in the future to help you create a more compelling narrative to communicate about your campaign or your work. Um, a lot about the work of <clears throat> changing a story and a narrative is that struggle um, to make visible something that's been made invisible by policy and prejudice. 
and you want to make it more visible to a wider audience. So this framework we're going to go through, it's going to help us to apply a narrative strategy analysis to an issue. And this will be an issue that's mainly in a situation where there's a power holder who tells a very different or specific story um, or status quo has a certain perception on an issue. We're going to, in this next segment here, in this next chart, walk through some elements to be able to build a story that uh, will help you to change and shift the narrative. Next slide. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> so there are going to be four main elements to a story when we look at narrative shift. Earlier on, when we started, we looked at three parts of a story. Right now, we're gonna talk about these four key elements. So you've got conflict, characters, imagery, and foreshadowing. Um, so it's gonna be really important because we're talking about storytelling to tell every story on its own terms and not necessarily, again, the truth. So with conflict, you wanna think about how is the problem being framed? Well, who is this conflict between anyway? Are there good guys, bad guys? What's at stake? So if you think back and draw a connection to the pyramid, we talked about really pulling out after the values when we talk about the problem and solution, really pulling out who the um, heroes are and who the villains are. You want to look at what's at stake. Part two here, another element of a story is going to be the characters. So when you're thinking about messaging around the campaign, think about who are those victims? Who are the messengers that tell the story? Do they get to speak for themselves or is someone speaking on their behalf? Then we wanna go into imagery. We know a picture is worth a thousand words, right? We're an incredibly visible, vis visual society. Um, so what powerful images come to mind that this story provides? Are there relevant metaphors, symbols, specific examples that embody the story? Because that might be the collection of artwork, clip art, photos you want to take, you know, um, images you might want to get online to be able to push this image, this story out with some visuals. And then lastly, foreshadowing. How does each story show us the future? What is the vision the story offers of how things will be if this conflict resolves successfully? And talking about that vision is really important. Giving people a picture in their mind of what is it we're fighting for? What is that thing for later? What will happen if we win? All right. The next three slides are gonna take us through each of those elements so that then you can go through, if you have a piece of paper, you give yourself, um, I think there's gonna be like five rows and three columns here to dig through each of these items. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about um, some work that I do uh, in coalition space around our people's budget, where people in the community come together with their needs and concerns and share with our local city government how they feel like our city budget should be prioritized based on community values to help push forward an anti-racist agenda that really promotes social justice. So by the end of the activity, you should be able to revisit this each story that you're thinking about telling and developing some frames and core messages to help you win the, as this activity is called, the battle of the story. All right. So what we've got here with the conflict, if I was thinking about how a problem is being framed, who's the conflict between good guys and bad guys with our people's budget, we're often looking at who's our city manager, for example. So who's the head of whatever this institution that you may be having some challenge with and how they're utilizing resources or overusing power and not really um, engaging or including the most marginalized folks. So we might say it's our mayor. In the past, we've said that. We'll see this coming year. Uh, we have a new mayor. We would say probably it's the city manager who controls all the staff in the city government. Um, we might say it's all the big businesses who come in to the city and are developing huge high rises and um, pu pushing people of color and poor people out of the city. And so we may say there's good guys and bad guys, and we might list on the left column some of those figureheads. And then on the right side, the folks who are part of our people's budget. So we've got people who work in uh, immigration work, um, grassroots organizers and nonprofit professional uh, folks, employees. We've got folks who work in, in housing organizing to make sure that there's affordable housing in the city. We could have folks from the senior community um, who really want to talk about how has, housing impacts them because the value is that everyone deserves to live in a safe home. Um, we could have Black Lives Matter be part of this. We could have um, 
there were some other groups, some youth organizations and youth and young people who really are experiencing this problem and wanting to be change agents. So that's what you put there um, up here at this top. I'm sorry, I'm kind of merging into characters as well. Um, so the conflict might be for our opposition and status quo. The, the conflict might be that, um, you know, folks want to make money. These developers, they want big business. Our city here, we're near the ocean. And, and this is like prime real estate where they want to achieve financially and grow and build because that's success to them. Whereas for the advocates and change agents, this might be um, young people. We've got a, a whole Cambodian community here in Long Beach where I live. Young folks who are from uh, maybe second or third generation people of color here, um, person who might be Cambodian who their families, grandparents moved here to get away from the Khmer Rouge and they want to continue to be able to live here. They're graduating high school. They're gonna go to a local college maybe. And they love this city and community because it was a safe haven for their family and then for people from, um, from the country where their grandparents are from. And so some of that conflict and problem there may be like, hey, we deserve to be able to enjoy our downtown and, and live here in the same home that I've grown up with that my grandma moved to or something. So just giving some examples there. Uh, the next one piece around characters, again, thinking about those victims. Who are the messengers that tell this story? That's really interesting to think about. Um, do they get to speak for themselves or is someone speaking on their behalf? Um, so it's pretty clear in a people's budget who the characters are and the messengers because it's usually the folks who are participating in the political process, decision-making. You've got lobbyists, you've got businesses, we've got wealthy business owners. Um, we might even look at racial background. It's gonna be predominantly white folks. There might be male figureheads as well who are part of the opposition and status quo. And then the advocates and change agents might not always have that ability or understanding of how to access the system and go speak at a city council meeting to give a public comment to talk about this conflict and their values. Next slide. Now, when we start breaking out the imagery, you wanna show and not tell people through images what the story is about. You can think about metaphors, symbols. This is for anyone who's creative or you want to be creative for five minutes, thinking about what are some examples of some imagery that can really embody your story. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. You know, there's some powerful images over time. I used to look at National Geographic um, when I was younger and remembering some of those images that like really capture, for example, war, right? Um, the girl, I want to say it was the girl was in Vietnam and she's like partially naked in the middle of the street crying. There had just been all this destruction. And here you see this child in this very vulnerable state. And that image, oh, that image was powerful. You can think back about other images that are powerful. You can also think silly. What are some silly symbols like, you know, that, that could represent maybe your villain? <laughs> I'm not going to go there right now, but you can think about those things and, and think about how much fun you want to have with using imagery to tell your story. Then we've got this foreshadowing piece. How does each story show us the future? What is the vision that the story offers of how things will be if that conflict resolves itself successfully? So here, there could be some foreshadowing often with our opposition and status quo. It's very, there's a lot of racial narrative. Um, there's some dog whistle politics. Them. There can be some very homophobic narrative. There can be very um, sexist stuff uh, around the vision of, you know, what would this city look like if there's all this wonderful development and all these um, folks who can afford these $3,000 studio high rise buildings near the beach and oh, just how beautiful the city is going to be without folks who are homeless and without people who are um, suffering from drug abuse or whatever it is, whatever that case is, you want to be as, as real as you can be about what are they saying as outrageous and absurd as it may sound as you're brainstorming. What is this foreshadowing that this opposition and status quo has in mind? And then for our advocates and change agents, this is a really beautiful place to land in. It kind of feels good once you get to this block, because then you start to talk about, okay, if we're able to have to really embrace the diversity we have here and keep people 
in their homes. We're going to have happy kids outside playing in their neighborhoods. And it's there's going to be a diverse group of kids of all backgrounds. And we're going to see access for people with disabilities to get into buildings or to go to the beach. There's going to be special mats for them to enjoy the beach. We just got that through some advocacy here in Long Beach. So you're going to start to envision what is that beautiful vision of what you're working toward that you want for your cause, for your community, for your issue. All right, um, we're getting close to time here. Next slide. The assumption. So here is, this is a final little bonus segment here, our opportunity to step out of the story and think about the assumptions that allow this story to operate. Um, for a lot of these, uh, the assumptions could be our core values. Um, so for the opposition story, these assumptions are usually contradictions and weaknesses. They're usually pretty absurd once you come to this section and you realize like, oh man, people don't really care about the truth. They're, they're buying into these strange contradictions, right? But through framing, we can challenge the story's framing by exposing the hidden agendas or contrasting visions of the future because it's gonna look very different between these two columns here. So what does someone have to believe to accept the story as true? For our opposition and status quo with the people's budget, someone might have to believe that a black person, an Asian person, um, a Latino, someone who's indigenous, a multiracial person, they may have to believe that they're dumb, that they don't work hard, that they're lazy, that they're you know, crime ridden and a risk and a threat to society. And so those are the kinds of things that will come out here. And so you'll be able to look at what values are reflected in this story. By challenging assumptions, we're going to be able to have very strong, powerful social change storytelling because the assumptions are what you have to believe to believe the story is true. And at the end of doing this whole activity, you can start to develop and list out what are some of those frames and core messages that you want to share in your social media campaign in your talking points, on your website, in your letter or your op-ed, you know, and in your visuals that you want to start putting around maybe the campus or the things you want to have built into the values and the processes by which you work in your workplace. Next slide. I hope that y'all are able to access uh, the document so that you can take a, you try out these things. They're really helpful tools. Even if you try one of them, get the hang of it. Like I print out that pyramid and I have it on the wall in a couple places at work so that we can use it as we're thinking about how to talk about our stories. Sometimes we'll do the earlier storytelling activities about a choice and a challenge. We'll do that in getting to know each other as we're onboarding new staff, for example, or if we're doing a team retreat. These are tools you can use in different ways um, in your workplace and in the groups that you're part of. So I just have a couple examples. I'll see if I can point out just a couple of things here. Um, we've got a couple minutes to to show you some visuals of how some of this work I've been able to help put into place. Um, it does take, it's, it's like building a muscle. You do have to practice it. I am not excellent at this in many ways. I'm still trying. And I think the thing I enjoy most right now is talking to other people about it because then I'm able to internalize it and practice it a little bit more. Um, okay, so here we've got our Be Well website. This is a volunteer group organization I helped to co-found out of a Black Lives Matter um, meeting here in Long Beach, our grassroots chapter, where we created um, a collection of folks, volunteers who really wanted to work on demystifying and destigmatizing mental health in the Black community, because there's a narrative, story upon story, that dealing with mental health and talking about mental health is scary, or weird, or evil, or sinful, right? And there are some ideas, especially connected to religion through African-American and Black history and culture in the United States around very strange narratives around mental health. So um, in this group, we share our vision on our social media, which talks about some of our values. Like we probably could have said all Black people should receive the care compassion, dignity, and respect that, well, we talk about it here, that everyone deserves when it comes to health. So you can see our value is being shared right there in our Instagram post. Um, you can see in the bottom left, this is a little bit of an older screenshot, but there's a call to action. That's that piece at the top of a pyramid, right? It's at the very top of this graphic. 
people being asked to sign a letter um, for Black Lives Matter. So that was a call to action example. Uh, the next image, you can see uh, we have this Earth Lodge Center for Restoration. You see this beautiful image of a tree, right? Look at that compared to the picture on the left. You can feel a very different vibe. You can see how an image can communicate something. I've been shifting in my our work around social justice and anti-racism to communicate through those more peaceful, beautiful images. Remember that chart, the bottom right corner to talk about that vision of what we see and what we want. And that's why I like that picture there in the middle. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide. We'll just kind of skip through a couple of these. Um, this first one here, this example, you're worth more than your productivity. That's a that's a cool little value and inspirational, a great image, just a way to, to talk about this work. Okay, next slide. Our work around mental health. Next slide, please. Um, we'll go to the next slide. You can just see some of the images are powerful there. Here's for the BLM grassroots website. Uh, let's see here. What can I show you as an example? Oh, uh, this picture in the middle, personalizing a story. Here's a story of a man who's 17, 72 year old grandfather that's building some connection, thinking about this man as part of a family. Um, and it tells a little bit about um, his experience, I believe he was incarcerated and finally sent home. Um, and so it tells a story in that image. So telling a story about a person in social media, right, to get people to, to know what's happening and, and personalize this issue around maybe wrongful incarceration or some of the things around the prison industrial complex that are really problematic. All right, next slide. Uh, here's our people's budget that I mentioned earlier. Um, images, imagery, we talked about imagery. That image of the fist, we use a lot. There are many versions of the fist. I think you see, oh, you see it in the background maybe here of, of my uh, slide here where I am. Um, that's a great example of an image, an image that can represent the story, the message, the narrative. Uh, thank you, Audrina. I see she's mentioning that that person earlier, the grandfather is a recent political prisoner who was released. All right, next slide, please. Um, I, I, may have mentioned that some of my earlier work around our people's budget, which a lot of what we're encouraging the community to better understand is that a lot of money goes to our police department and instead could be shifted to some more proactive preventative um, departments and work that could then help us to avoid uh, the need for mass incarceration and punitive measures. So we believe like being able to put money into the health department would be great. It can help our families and communities to be health healthier and our children able to go to school and thrive, et cetera. So in this image here, we shifted to, to using images that represent that vision of what we want, that beautiful vision of we want to see multicultural community, people getting along, having fun in the park. This was even during the pandemic. And so we talked about love, that value of love, because people might think, oh, you're saying defund the police. You must hate our city, you terrible person. That was that narrative in that first column. But no, we're saying, no, we actually love this city. We are this city. We love each other. We got each other. This budget we're talking about, it's not about just defunding the police, which may piss people off. It's a community care budget. So we put those values in there. All right, I think we can skip through the next couple of slides. Uh, keep families housed, the value, housing's a human right. That's one of my favorites. Keep families together, yep. Keeps, yep. So those are just a couple of examples of, of ways that you can use imagery, words, values, narrative uh, to communicate about your cause. And lastly, I, I'd like to pause here with this African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And in storytelling, we're able to amplify each other's stories. When we're marginalized and don't have the voice, allies can step in and share, share those stories, tell those stories one-on-one -on -one with people, build that feeling amongst folks to be more opened up and able to listen and have a sense of curiosity and want to have a sense of empathy and feel a shared connection of humanity with others who may not be just like them. And by doing this together, telling story together, amplifying stories, building in that cross section of identity and stories and how they connect, that can really help us to go further in our fight uh, for social justice. Next slide. 
here you'll find a list of some of these tools that I was able to pull some of this content from, um, as well as some social media tools. If you're looking to tell story on social media, um, if you want some cool templates to design graphics to put out there, um, some social media platforms you might, might want to consider if you want to go that route and telling your story. There's also traditional media, of course. Um, and so this will be shared in that PDF of our slides. And then last but not least, here's my contact information. Uh, I'm Melissa Morgan, and you can email me at email melissamorgan at gmail.com. And I am here to answer any questions that folks have. In the meantime, I will put into the chat uh, the PDF of our slides from today. What questions can I answer for folks? Yeah, we do have an opportunity for our participants to um, ask questions. You can um, type them in the Q&A. I am seeing you're more likely to die by an ostrich than by a shark. <laughs> wow, <laughs> pretty amazing. Melissa, I, I just want to say that I, so much of what you talked about today um, is it's these are things that we talk about with our students in communication. And, and I think, you know, especially this idea that facts don't change people's minds is really a difficult one sometimes for faculty to wrap their heads around um, because we deal in the realm of uh, arguments and evidence and reasoning. Um, but when we think about the primary ways in which we communicate with each other, um, we do that primarily through narrative. Um, you know, we make sense of our experiences and our world through the elements of narrative, through, you know, uh, the characters and the, um, the actions and, and the context and the setting in which it is occurring. Um, and so um, I think so much of what you've shared with us today um, you know, make so many really good points uh, for people who are interested in really thinking strategically about our messaging. Um, and again, um, thanks for sharing all of the tools as well, um, the links for all the tools. You got okay. it. I'm looking to see if there are any questions. Wait. We added in the chat the PDF of the slide so you can have a copy of that without that terrible yellow highlighting, sorry. I'm seeing a question, does the education level matter when messaging um, from the messenger or the education of the audience? I would say, I'll answer both. Um, the great thing about messaging in social media, if you're using that tool, which how many of you have your phone right next to you right now? And it's part of your daily. My kids even take it into the bathroom. Like these things are with us everywhere, every day. And uh, especially as folks in North America, we are constantly accessing our phones. So there is a lot of um, communication to be doing with social media. Um, what I would recommend if you are trying to message for folks from different education level, especially you all coming from a university culture, I call it translating, translating the big picture concepts and ideas that you have in your mind. If you're with an institution in particular, or you have certain jargon that is very familiar to you and native. For the general public, they're looking at, they just want a couple of words and letters that would fit into a tweet that would make sense to them. So think of yourself as a translator to translate these big picture messages into the values and the feelings that anyone could understand. Think about talking to your grandma versus a kindergartner versus, you know, maybe whomever you may be thinking about in your mind. Um, think about how would you translate that message to them? Um, as far as you, if you're the communicator and you're thinking about your education level, I would challenge you too to think about um, what is it that people like you know or don't know, or people who are different from you know and don't know, and try to find that meeting point to communicate. I'm also seeing a question about how valuable is print media in this age of social media? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm thinking about in my experience, it's going to depend on your target audience more than anything. Who's your target audience and who is picking up the, the paper, for example, and which newspaper is that newspaper's target audience? 
uh, magazines. I think magazines might be making a comeback. I'm going to guess. Um, but magazines and their niches of who's your audience, 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 audience is super important to think about um, in what kind of media you want to communicate with. There um, is also in the Q&A, um, not a question, just many thanks, uh, very helpful strategies for campaigns and for class as well. So thank you from Andrea. Oh, wonderful. Great. Any other lingering questions? Oh, here we go. Let's see. Um, so can you share best practices about translating a primary message in English to other languages in a way that doesn't sound so robotic or scripted? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, well, uh, I'll give you a couple of things that we do at work. We do have like a, like a, a running list of some of the common phrases we use in our work because we often are talking about social justice terms. And sometimes those phrases could be, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out what's the best way to translate this for the audience. Um, that's helped us to kind of come to an agreement among some terms and then go back and change it too with the times if, if terms and, and language is changing and an understanding around some of these issues. For example, we talk often in our work about how do we talk about being a black person and black lives matter in Spanish, right? And then we will translate, we'll have stuff translated to Khmer for our Cambodian community. And what we found there through our school district institution and our city institution is sometimes the translators or interpreters that they use are using a certain academic level of language that maybe isn't um, the best to communicate with an elder here who has come over from Cambodia that doesn't have an education past middle school or elementary school. And so there's things about culture and understanding where people come from um, around being able to uh, translate or interpret, interpret messaging there. Um, as far as not sounding robotic or scripted, I'm not sure I can say much to that, except that we've, we've been paying attention to how we communicate with our audience, our community on different platforms. So like in Facebook, we have some groups where we put our, um, we have a Kamai speaking group and then a Spanish group so that folks who are already following our page on Facebook could go to their particular native language and also find that copy of whatever the material is that we're um, translating in that language posted there just for them. That's helped us a little bit. And then we also have folks of different age levels who help us with the translation so that they can bring in maybe some of the newer phrases and be a little bit more relatable if the audience is a younger audience. Um, Diane, do you have any, any tips on that? I'm curious. Anything you've done? I think that it, it's a really good point because some things don't translate well. Um, uh, you know, uh, I I was just reading an article with my graduate students about um, the discourse of pro-choice and how that doesn't really translate very well in terms of um, Spanish language and that, you know, really the better frame becomes reproductive freedom. Um, and that also allows for a, a broader understanding, right, of um, reproductive freedom. And so sometimes in the act of translating, it can be very transformative in terms of what you think you're actually um, advocating for as well. Um, and it can become more inclusive then of more people's lived experiences. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, having, um, you know, uh, folks who actually speak the language that to which you are trying to translate to becomes very important um, when it comes to uh, translating messages, making sure that you have readers um, who are native speakers who can kind of speak to some of these issues that you're talking about, for sure. We do have another uh, question in the chat. Um, Melissa mentioned that she really enjoys storytelling through writing. Are there some recommendations that you have for us of a very powerful social justice, social justice narrative told through writing? Um, I, I hope that this is a decent answer for you of what you're asking for. Um, 
I will say that I like writing to be able to speak about it, or I, I love facilitating. I love talking about these issues through conversation and dialogue more than me storytelling um, or creating an image that can represent the story. Um, but what I've, I've, I've got a subscription, I think my mom gave me to Yes Magazine and Sojourners. I think Sojourners is Christian based, but I'm finding they're, they're doing some really cool writing in this magazine around current to date social justice issues in a way that I have never seen like come from um, a Christian community, having grown up Christian and Catholic. Um, so I've just found, I really enjoy reading the Yes Magazine articles and Sojourners and just seeing how they write about this stuff. Um, they have a, a breadth, I think, of staff and different writing styles. So I've enjoyed that a lot. Um, I don't have anything else that's coming to mind right now. Um, oh, I will share this. There's Movement for Black Lives. Um, they have some really cool stuff and are very like current with what they put up on their website. Um, so that also comes up for me, yeah. And I was thinking too about this question that was in the chat around print media. You know, when it comes to communications too, especially now, I think this has been reinforced through the COVID pandemic, going old school is really important. So that means paper and pen, uh, printing things on paper, walk, canvassing, walking things to people's doors or their desks, giving people a printed thing to hang up in a laundromat or in a the coffee shop or in your staff meeting room. Paper still can, yeah, print media in that sense can still reach people. Also, if you have it translated in language, is for people and take into communities if you're working in community where people maybe don't have access to internet it's still really important to do that phone calls are still effective in storytelling and messaging so just remembering there was a time before the internet and because you're going to probably find the most marginalized people that way who are impacted often by the issues we work on around social justice and then can give voice to these issues to make some of that change and can tell their story. All right. Well, um, I see a thank you in the chat. And I think um, given the time, uh, it may be uh, uh, time for us to um, uh, wrap this up. And so I wanna thank you all for your thoughtful questions and your comments. And I especially wanna thank Melissa for all the wonderful um, uh, ideas and tools um, that I know are gonna be really important for us as we move forward as a union.